Hello. Um, so I uh, also have a, a problem like Amit uh, to do with the language. I am German, but I've lived in the UK for 13 years. And ever since I've started looking and working on global health issues, I've only done this in English. So I have a real problem speaking about this topic in German. So I, I apologize. I, I will speak in, in English um, to just make it easier for me. So um, we've had uh, briefly before that, the, that we have a new outbreak of Ebola um, a couple of days or probably more likely weeks ago in the DRC in, in Congo. And um, it's not quite clear when it started because information and, uh, and specimens to test travel uh, take a long time to travel, but it looks like it's a so far reasonably small outbreak of uh, about nine or 12 cases. And it is also different to what we've seen in 2014 because it is a, um, a relatively remote area of the Congo where, where this is happening. But nevertheless, uh, WHO and many others are tweeting like crazy about it and uh, a lot of um, news media have picked up the story. And so when I came over to Berlin for this talk, I looked a little bit at this media coverage. And I was surprised that, like, or probably I wasn't surprised, but one sort of key uh, message that a lot of the articles asked was whether the world now is better prepared um, than it was in 2014. And the answer seems sort of to be a bit mixed. So on the one hand, there was acknowledgement that WHO has been um, implementing some reforms. They have sort of strengthened or tried to strengthen their emergency response capacities. We have now the World Bank, pandemic emergency financing facility. So things have been um, underway. But on the other hand, there was also acknowledgement that the health systems in these countries um, are as in as bad a state as they were before. But most of the articles mentioned also what one of um, the speakers in the audience uh, said earlier, we now have a vaccine. So obviously the world must be better prepared than it was a couple of years ago. And it is true there is a, is a vaccine uh, that um, I think in the summer of 2015, clinical trials reported uh, that this vaccine has a very high rate of protection. And this vaccine was initially, the compound was initially developed by the Public Health Agency of Canada and then later licensed out to two pharmaceutical companies, New Link, a very small uh, company, and then uh, Merck, a big pharmaceutical company. Uh, licenses and took it into further development and trials. Importantly, part of the story is that this vaccine was developed in really a record time of about a year. Um, so this process would usually take many years. And while it was still far too late to benefit most victims of the outbreak in 2014, this vaccine is really hailed as a probably the only success story of the international Ebola response in 2014. Um, and when people speak about the success story, they often attribute it to an extraordinary collaboration, an extraordinary partnership between a, a wide range of, of individuals and organizations ranging from governments, WHO, Pharmaceutical companies, obviously, um, philanthropic organizations, notably the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but also the Wellcome Trust in the UK, and, and NGOs. So the emphasis really is on this extraordinary partnership, people getting together and, and, and working on this with all the resources they had. And I don't want to... Um, dispute that this was an extraordinary collaboration and it was an extraordinary success. But what I want to highlight here a bit more is that this isn't, this collaboration didn't appear out of nowhere. It didn't just emerge in a vacuum. But that 
the, the sort of the ground for this collaboration had been prepared for, for a long time. And it had been prepared, I think, in terms of um, a certain mindset, um, a certain organizational structure that had been developed, uh, regulatory structures, and also social networks. So when um, we look back at um, the evolution, the development of global health governance in the last 20 years or so, we see that a mindset has emerged that seems to increasingly see the supply of medicines and vaccines as the most appropriate or best way to address global health issues. So this links in very much in what we've heard before from Thomas and Amit, a very biomedical understanding of health and therefore also of um, what the solutions to health problems um, could be, which um, pays less attention to social determinants of health. So this is a certain mindset that has developed in global health uh, in the last two decades, and I think which is part of where the, um, the collaboration for the Ebola vaccine uh, came about. This mindset is manifest in the proliferation of organizations in the last 20 years in the field of global health who are mandated in one way or the other with facilitating the supply of medicines and vaccines, especially to low- and middle-income countries. So be it through financing uh, the development or the distribution of medicines and vaccines, like the Global Fund, or the distribution, creating distribution systems for how to get medicines and vaccines to, um, into these countries, or actually to develop new drugs and vaccines. So the um, wide uh, range or great number of so-called product development partnerships um, such as DNDI, the TB Alliance, um, various others. And these organizations have essentially created and experimented with a new organizational model of how to do pharmaceutical research and development outside the profit-driven uh, industry uh, world. Um, how to do pharmaceutical development in a non-for-profit setting, in a setting where you have to work with a wide range of, of stakeholders from different, different sectors. So the collaboration for the Ebola vaccine drew on or could make use of ex a lot of experience that had been gained in how, how to organize pharmaceutical development outside the industry. And it could also, so the Ebola vaccine collaboration could also draw on a really vast network, a social network of people who have been working in this sort of, uh, in this field. And if you look at people who are involved in the collaboration for Ebola, for the Ebola vaccine, you see a lot of the same names that you see also uh, working on um, product development in uh, ne neglected tropical diseases, bioterrorism, uh, antimicrobial resistance. And then finally, the Ebola um, vaccine collaboration can also draw on a set of regulations that have changed to facilitate uh, development, pharmaceutical development for NTD drugs, for drugs um, that are, might, be might, might be used, might be needed for, in the case of a bioterrorist attack. So these particular drugs in the, in, uh, in the US are called medical countermeasures. And in order to facilitate the development of medical countermeasures or of drugs and vaccines that are required in an epidemic, you need certain, uh, you, need, you probably cannot rely on the conventional uh, pathways of approving these medicines because you cannot conduct clinical trials in the same way. And to facilitate uh, the development of such drugs, uh, we've seen regular changes in the US and Europe and also at the international level. So I guess what, what I want to say here is oops, very much in line with um, what Anne said at the beginning. When we look at Ebola, it, there's, there's a lot of urgency and emergency of, uh, sort of uh, a sense, and, and a lot of things seem, seem sensible in, in a situation that seemed so threatening, even though, as Ahmed said, how much of that 
threat is actually is real is a different question. But sort of to step back from this individual disease and this individual uh, focus and look at the broader picture. And the broader picture, or part of the broader picture that I wanted to uh, speak about here is that it isn't that unique a case and the response to race into the development of a new drug is also not that unique a case, but it is sort of part of a quite a long-term trend now where we have found ways of or, or, uh, seeking to address global health problems through supplying medicines and vaccines. Now, another issue I have looked at in, in the past is to what extent this focus on um, providing drugs and vaccines in global health is linked to the uh, increasing understanding of health as a security threat. So whether this phenomenon which in sociology has, has been labeled pharmaceuticalization of health is linked to the securitization of health. And I think it is not in a, in a sort of simplistic way of one causing the other, but these two phenomena having, well, first of all, they have, um, they have appeared and emerged and de developed at the same time, but they seem to also support each other uh, at times, um, fuel each other. So just to give one example, when we, when we look at a health problem, through the lens of security. So when we understand a health issue as a security threat, we are in the mindset of wanting an immediate response. We want a rapid response because we create the sense, we create a mindset of urgency, of, of a, a, a danger that is potentially um, um, irreversible. And in this situation, as Tina mentioned, um, before, there isn't much time to think about complex underlying root causes and complex sort of socioeconomic factors. The mindset is, is one of, we need to do something now, as quickly as possible. We need to intervene. And in this context, Inter an intervention through a technology like a medicine or vaccine seems particularly appropriate because if, if we have a vaccine or, 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 or a drug that can help, we have something to respond quickly. And I think that's part of the reason why in the field of health security, since its beginnings really in the 1990s in the United States, where it emerged around the, the problem of, of biodefense, bioterrorism, where one of the first steps that was taken was to strengthen the state's capability to develop medical countermeasures. So it was from the beginning in the US in the sort of health security field, the response, one of the key responses was a pharmaceutical response. And then also the other way around, I think we've seen that the the emphasis of health as a security problem has facilitated pharmaceutical development because the moment you speak about an issue as a health threat, or as a threat, not as a health threat specifically, but the moment you speak about any issue as a threat to security, you, it's, it's a politically very powerful tool to mobilize attention, to mobilize resources, and I think we have seen that in in the field of pharmaceutical development as well, where just by saying something is a health issue, is a security threat, we got the attention not just of the health ministers, but of the ministers of the, uh, foreign affairs or even the heads of state. Resources, financial resources were made available. And also there was a willingness to think about regulatory change that might not have been there if it was just perceived as a development problem or an equality problem. So these two, I think these two developments of pharmaceuticalization and securitization of health, they, they feed on each other. And also, um, another observation is that in the wake of the Ebola outbreak in 2014, these two worlds seem to have become even more intertwined. So the focus on developing medical counter, so the, the, the very word medical countermeasures is now also part of the discourse at the international level, not just in the US anymore. 
So WHO uses the term medical countermeasures now routinely as well. And so the, the development of medical uh, countermeasures for pandemic preparedness seems to be now one of the key um, at the heart of what we have learned from Ebola. So just two examples, WHO uh, developed what they call a blueprint of procedures to facilitate the accelerated development of drugs and vaccines needed for an epidemic. So they are working on uh, how to set up financial procedures to support such development, how to facilitate regulatory changes that might be needed, and how to um, work on how, how do we run clinical trials in an outbreak situation. So they, there's a, a, a great emphasis on facilitating pharmaceutical development in an outbreak situation by WHO. And a few months ago, a new organization has been uh, launched, um, already endowed, I think, with half, half a billion dollars, uh, called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, called short CEPI. And CEPI is, again, a public-private partnership driven, I think, mainly by the governments of the US and Norway, but with support from India, from Germany, and many other countries. Industry is involved. Um, uh, the Wellcome Trust is involved, the Gates Foundation is involved. And the purpose of this set of CEPI is to develop compounds for vaccines that might be needed in an epidemic up to the stage of roughly sort of proof of concept and then stockpile those compounds so that in the case of an outbreak, they can be then rapidly brought sort of to product to the stage of the product, to the market. And the other idea is that they develop a platform technology that can be used for various pathogens. But again, a lot of effort, a lot of money going into medical countermeasure development. So the Ebola uh, epidemic, uh, as I see it, has brought these two trends of the focus of sort of a medical gaze, pharmaceutical gaze on global health more closely together with the security. Um, gaze. Um, I think I leave it here and we can talk more maybe about the trade-offs and, and the discussion afterwards. But I guess what I wanted really to emphasize uh, here is that the, what's happening in the wake of Ebola is part of a longer, long-term context, an institutional context, but also one that has to do with how we perceive the problem and what kind of solutions we look for. Thank you.